Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. Greetings. My name is Jeff Ross. I'm one of the associate pastors here at the Roswell United Methodist Church. And thanks for tuning in and being a part of worship today. Our scripture is from John's Gospel, chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. Now, six days before the Passover, Jesus arrived at Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume, and she poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray Jesus, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wage. He did this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. But Jesus said, leave her alone. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. May God add his blessing to our reading and hearing and understanding of his word. Well, so Jesus is anointed. You may have heard this story before. Uh, and so I want to ask you uh, uh, whether you believe this story happened to Jesus or, or this event happened to Jesus one time, two times, or three times. And why I ask that is because there's different versions of this story in the Gospels. It's recorded in all four of the Gospels, but it's a little different. So let's take a look and then you can decide if it's one, two, or three times. In John, it says this happened six days before the Passover at Lazarus's house in Bethany, who is the brother of Martha and Mary. Mary, the sister of Lazarus, is the one who anoints Jesus with the oil. She anoints his feet. Now Judas, one of the disciples, is the one who complains about all this happening. And it says the purpose of this anointing was to prepare Jesus for burial. So that's John's version. In Luke... This story happens in the seventh chapter, and it's long before Passover. It's not connected to Passover at all. In Luke's gospel, the event takes place at one of the Pharisees' house. In Luke's gospel, a sinner, that's the only name given the person who does the anointing, uh, 
But this sinner is the one who anoints Jesus. And again, like in John, this sinner anoints his feet. But in Luke, it's a Pharisee who complains that the money could have been better spent. And then at the end of the story, Jesus says to the woman, Go, for your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Now, the, the third version is recorded in both Matthew and Mark, pretty much the same story. And it says that this was two days before the Passover. It was at Simon the leper's house. And Simon the leper is not a Pharisee or a disciple. A woman does the anointing. Again, doesn't have a name for her, just a woman. And in this case, in both Matthew and Mark, it's Jesus' head that's anointed and not his feet. In Matthew, it's one of the disciples who complain about this use of uh, resources. And in Mark's gospel, it just says some people that are there uh, complain. In Matthew and Mark, both of them say, like John, that the purpose of this anointing was to prepare Jesus for burial. So there you have it. Four versions of this story, uh, all just a little bit different. Uh, and so do you think that this anointing of Jesus happened three times, two times, or just one time with a different spin on it? Well, if you're confused, you're not alone. Christian scholars uh, debate whether this was one event, two events, or three events. And for our purposes today, it doesn't really matter uh, because however many times it happened, it was awkward. Jesus doesn't seem to feel or act awkwardly. And that's what's puzzling about this story to me. He leans right into this event. He leans right into what's going on, embraces it, doesn't seem to get flustered or out of sorts. Uh, he's even uh, very forceful in coming to the defense of the person who anoints his feet when it's challenged and people complain about it. Now, what's really interesting about Jesus' demeanor during this whole event is what happens in chapter 13 of John's gospel. The very next chapter, at the beginning of the 13th chapter, it tells the story of Jesus uh, washing the disciples' feet. It's not the same as the anointing, but it's a similar sort of event. And in that event, the disciples are completely uh, uh, feeling awkward. Uh, they don't like it. They don't feel like they're worthy. Uh, Peter especially uh, goes on and on about how uh, Jesus shouldn't be doing this. In fact, the roles are, ought to be reversed. See, Jesus welcomes this show. Jesus welcomes this honoring, this grace, this gift uh, that is given to him in these uh, stories. Uh, but the disciples don't. And I think it says something about Jesus that Jesus is trying to convey to you and me, but it's so hard for us, this side of heaven, to get to that same mindset. So what is going on with Jesus um, in these events and what's going on with the disciples and us. So um, what, what is an awkward situation for you? Where have you been that was really awkward? Uh, if, if you had been a part of uh, something like this, that certainly would have been awkward. But if you do a Google search, uh, it says that some of the most awkward moments are these accidentally ending a work call where you might be talking to your boss or a coworker with, okay, well, I love you. <laughs> uh, we get used to saying that to our spouse or kids, and so sometimes it slips up in a work conversation. Another awkward moment is complaining about a, uh, a co-worker or somebody we know about the way they're acting or treating us, and then turn to find that they're standing right behind us. That's awkward. Forgetting a friend's birthday, uh, waving at somebody by accident. Hey, Charlie, how are And they turn around and you realize it's not Charlie. 
spilling coffee on your white shirt or, or blouse on your way to work, texting the wrong person. Hey, I look forward to us getting together tonight. Uh, uh, I'll see you around 8 o'clock. Uh, and then realize you've sent that text to the wrong person. Bumping into a mannequin and then saying, oh, excuse me, I'm sorry. Uh, and then recognizing that it's a mannequin and not a person. Those are some awkward moments, and we all have them. Uh, we live life in awkward ways sometimes. But it's interesting that in this event that we've read and looked at and looked at in the different uh, Gospels, that Jesus doesn't appear to feel awkward. He doesn't appear uh, to uh, process this event as an awkward event. And in fact, he, he seems to recline, embrace the uh, attention. Uh, even in uh, Luke's gospel, he continues to talk to people and tell stories while this anointing is happening. Uh, Jesus doesn't seem phased at it at all. He doesn't get weirded out about it. He allows, he allows the person to continue uh, doing this without stopping or interfering. It's the, it's the people around Jesus that feel awkward. It's the people around Jesus that are looking for something to say that uh, would put this to a stop. But Jesus is kind. Jesus is gracious. Jesus seems to feel honored. And that's odd because it's not just an act of gratitude and kindness. It's an over-the-top act of, of generosity and kindness. It is a lot of perfume. Uh, it is a lot of money uh, that's, that's been uh, used here. Uh, the detractors of Jesus in this event uh, say it's a wasteful show of resources and money. And if this has happened two or three times, like the, the Gospels suggest, I'm sure that when it happened the second and third time, people said, oh my gosh, again? What's going on? Well, how do you feel when you're put on the spot? Is there an awkwardness that you have experienced? Maybe in retirement? Uh, you had a retirement function where you were the center of attention and people talking about you and different things. That's an, that, that's an awkward experience, uh, how you process that. 50th anniversary celebrations, a 40th birthday, 18th uh, birthday, if you receive some sort of award. Uh, those events are awkward for us because oftentimes we don't feel deserving. That's a human struggle uh, that uh, as people are lifting up and they see us in a certain way, uh, we step back behind the mirror and behind the mask and we realize that, um, that they don't know everything and, and things that we've held on to, things that we haven't shared, things that we know about ourselves that we feel unworthy uh, to receive or to be present in that time. Sometimes, even worse, we feel less than or unworthy. We feel shame. Many of us feel an awkwardness even when we hide that from others. I'm thankful for the work of Brene Brown uh, a writer who has talked at great lengths about shame and vulnerability and how people process that and deal with that and the rampant uh, uh, struggle that shame and vulnerability uh, are in our community and society. She says that shame is the warm feeling that washes over us, making us feel small and flawed and never good enough. She says that shame is the intensely painful feeling or experience of believing that we are flawed and therefore unworthy of love and belonging. So here's the thing. Life is hard 
but we make it so much harder by the voices we listen to and what we allow to ourselves to think about ourselves in response to those voices. We hear on the one side these wonderful uh, promises uh, in the Bible, in church, in Scripture, that God so loved the world that He gave His only Son. 1 John 1.9 says, If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The struggle is that we have such a hard time believing that. The way that a lot of folks process those words is that God does love people, uh, but maybe those people and not me. Maybe God can forgive those people who ask, but I'm not sure God can forgive me. We have such a hard time leaning into the promises of God. We have such a hard time seeing ourselves through God's eyes. As we look at ourselves through God's eyes, we see uh, the lack of things that we've done. We feel unworthy. We feel like we haven't measured up. We feel like we've let people down. We've said the wrong things. We've done the wrong things. Uh, We haven't lived life to the best of our ability. That's what the, uh, that's the voice that Satan speaks into our head. You'll never be good enough. You'll never measure up. We know that these promises uh, are from God, but are they for us or just for those folks over there? It's so hard to move from knowledge in our head to embracing that in our heart. We know these things to be true, and we've heard these things all our lives, but experiencing them and embracing them and walking in them, that is so difficult for a lot of folks to do. So in in this story, there's an awkwardness there. But as we see in the difference between John 12 and John 13, Uh, the disciples experience the awkwardness, but Jesus doesn't. Jesus doesn't feel the awkwardness because Jesus is used to this relationship with God that's been cultivated over a lifetime. Jesus knows God. Jesus knows the goodness of God. Jesus knows that God is on his side and God's not waiting for Jesus to mess up so he can zap him, so he can destroy his life, so he can make life miserable uh, for Jesus. Jesus is happy to receive the blessing because he knows that this goodness of God permeates everything. Last Sunday, Dr. Davis talked about the prodigal son And that story is such a great illustration because the son uh, comes to this realization that he's messed up, that he squandered this uh, fortune that he's been given, uh, that he's uh, taken advantage of his father's goodness, uh, and he reconciles himself to the reality that he has failed, that he has brought shame on the family. Uh, But he also recognizes how good his father treats the servants And compared to how he's being treated right now, he decides to go home and beg his father to allow him to live uh, in the family uh, compound uh, as a servant. And so as the son makes his way home, you know the story, the father sees him from a great distance and runs, uh, embraces the son, uh, and welcomes him back to the the family. Most of us can't fathom that sort of goodness, that sort of grace. But Jesus can, and he's telling us that story, that that is who God is. And that's what he wants us to know about God and about who we are. That we're, we're not these folks that have messed up everything in our lives. God doesn't see us that way. And I think that's also the, the, the journey towards Easter that we've been on during Lent. Easter's two weeks away, and I hope that as we reflect on the Easter story, 
and what Jesus does for you and me on the cross out of love for us. Jesus is not on the cross of spewing foul anger and resentment and uh, retaliation and revenge out on all the people there that are responsible for the crucifixion. Jesus is embracing this event as the way to help us discover the love of God. It's out of love for you and me that Christ offers his life on the, on the cross. That is a tremendous gift. Is that something that's awkward to receive? You know, a, a gift just sits on the table until it's opened and received by the one to whom it's given. Easter is an incredible gift to humanity. And I hope that as we move towards it this Easter, you'll be able to receive it and embrace it and recognize that God's love is offered even to you and me. Let us pray. Gracious God, we, we struggle with our humanity. We struggle with who we are and how we feel about ourselves, and that permeates into so many different things. It affects the way we treat others. It's the way we treat ourselves. Uh, it affects our faith and our actions. And it's hard, God, sometimes to get our heads around your love and your grace and your embrace as we come home to you. But help us, God, as we move towards Easter to see that, to feel that, to embrace that, to welcome that, and for that not to be awkward as we think about your love and grace. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. Hi. Thank you for joining us. My name is Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Our mission here at RUMC is to help people live a Christ-centered life. We're a welcoming church, we're a biblical church, and we're a compassionate church. That the, we believe that the way that, that God made us, that he made us in his image. And what the Bible tells us is that his image is an us, is an our. When God said in the creation story, let us create humans in our image, he made us to be in community together. He made us to connect to him and one another. That's the place that this is at Roswell United Methodist Church, a place of community and faith. I want to invite you to join us. It might be online, it might be through social media, or it might be here in person. We meet at 9 o'clock in a contemporary service with a band. We also have two 1115 services. One is here in the sanctuary with a traditional choir an organ. We also meet at 1115 with a band in our chapel. Thank you for joining us, and I look forward to meeting you.